John chapter 6 verses 41 through 45 today. I am so winded today, I can't stand it. John chapter 6 verses 41 through 45. The word of the Lord reads today from the King James text. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. And I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. I want to talk to us for a while today on the topic teach me. Teach me. Master, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to hear from the Word of God, to break the bread of life, that our faith might be inspired and encouraged today by the Word of Truth. For you declare in this sacred text that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You've laid a message on my heart and my body is utterly wiped out today. And if ever I needed the anointing, the touch from heaven to deliver a word to the people of God, I need it today. Master, touch me, help me. Lord, help my spirit today. The word of God said a, wound, a broken spirit can no man bear. And my spirit is broken today. Help me, Lord, in the name of Jesus to deliver the word of God for the benefit and the blessing of your people. I ask you today in none other than Jesus' wonderful sacred name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Most evangelical Christians today have been brought up in a faith and in a theology of absolutes. Every single choice we make, every single thing we say or do, according to evangelical preachers and Christians, is a matter of heaven or hell. Our faith in Christ is contingent upon our ability to walk on water and live above sin. The slightest indiscretion, the slightest failing, and we will miss the rapture and slide into hell on grease skids. That is the message that so many of us have been brought up on. I was talking to a cousin of mine on the phone yesterday, and she made a comment, and I first thought that went through my head is, there you go, there's that good old evangelical garbage again. She said something about, you know, her sister, my other cousin, passed away a few weeks ago. She was only 62 
years of age. Lucky her, she just dropped dead of a heart attack. Fell to the floor, was gone. Her sister, my other cousin, the only remaining member of that family, said to me, she said, well, you know, you just got to be ready. You just got to live ready. When your time comes, your time comes. She said, I just hope my time doesn't come right after I've had a cushion jag or gotten upset or mad at somebody or something. And I thought to myself, see, see, there is that evangelical garbage. You're going to miss heaven because you had a bad day. You're going to miss heaven because you lost your temper. You're going to miss heaven because you cussed. You're going to miss heaven because you did something, said something, went somewhere. You weren't supposed to go. You weren't supposed to say. You weren't supposed to do. Where on earth is grace in that theology? <laughs> Truth of the matter is, according to evangelical theology, your salvation is 100% contingent upon your works and your ability to be something perhaps that you're not, to do something perhaps that you cannot do. But that is not the message of God's Word. The truth today is many, if not most, of the teachings of God's Word are not at all a matter of edict or law. Did you hear what I just said? Many if not most of the teachings of God's Word are not a matter of edict or law. But rather, they are an impartation of divine wisdom and supernatural instruction. If we do things as God would instruct us to do them, Listen, we will live our best lives, experience the blessings of heaven, and walk in the divine favor of our God. It has nothing to do with whether or not you're going to make heaven or miss heaven. In our primary text today, Jesus spoke of the fact that the prophets declared that they shall all be taught of God. This was a prophecy that one day God himself would teach his people. And the Lord said, Every man therefore that hath heard and have learned of the Father. Everybody, listen carefully now, this, this is what the Lord was saying. The King James says it in such a way that it really is not clearly stated to modern English speaking people. He said, everyone therefore that understands what the prophet has said and desires to learn from the Father, listen carefully now, he said, comes to me. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Because when you learn at Jesus' feet, you are being taught by God himself. Hallelujah to God. Yes. Jesus said, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I am come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. He did not just come 
to save our soul from a devil's hell and to give us eternal life, but he came so that the quality of our life on this planet in this lifetime could be better. How does he better our lives? It's very simple. He teaches us. A lot of times your parents would try to teach you things. They say go to bed at a decent hour. Get enough sleep. Eat even the vegetables that you don't like because your body needs the, vi the vitamins, the minerals, the nutrients that are offered by those vegetables. Were they trying to make your life miserable? Was it their intention to make you unhappy and just to make your life a miserable experience? I don't want to eat Brussels sprouts. I don't want to eat broccoli. I don't want to eat a liver. I want to go to bed at 4 in the morning instead of at 8 or 9 o'clock at night. No, they were trying to teach you, listen to me, they were trying to teach you life skills and life lessons that would help you to be healthy, that would help you to be able to function well in this life. Am I telling the truth? Were all the things they were trying to teach you convenient? Were all the things they were trying to teach you things that made you happy? No. But that does not mean that their motivation was negative. It does not mean that they were somehow being malicious or being nasty simply because they were trying to teach you to do things that you may not otherwise want to do. Do you understand what I'm telling you today? The same is true today of our God. Much of what we read in the Word of God hasn't got a thing in the universe to do with whether or not you're going to heaven or hell. Much of what we read in the Word of God is God instructing us and teaching us how we can have the most healthy and productive and prosperous and blessed of lives. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Oh, I want to tell you, every man shall be taught of God. Lord, teach me. There's an old adage that says, hand a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. One of the biggest mistakes that so many Christians make, so many believers make this mistake. They constantly go to their knees in prayer and they're constantly asking God to give me, give me, give me, give me. Lord, give me more money. Give me a better job. Hello now. Give me a bigger house. Give me a nicer car. Give me a husband. Give me a wife. Give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. Do you know what they ought to be praying instead of gimme, gimme, gimme? They ought to be praying, Lord, teach me, teach me, teach me. Teach me, Lord, how to do things in such a way that I can be prosperous, that I can make more money. Teach me, Lord, how to do things in such a way so that I can one day drive a nicer car. Teach me, Lord, how to be so that I can find a good quality life partner 
partner who will be with me and stay with me throughout all the ups and downs and hardships and difficulties and trials and tribulations of this life. If I had a nickel for every time somebody came to me, and I've got members of my own family who do this, they're always telling me, well, bless God, they're always angry at God. Well, bless God, I keep asking the Lord to give me more money. He doesn't give me more money. No, he sure don't. I asked the Lord to give me a good husband. He never gave me a good husband. No, he sure didn't. You know why? I'll tell you why. Because nowhere in your life journey did you ever learn how to handle more money. Nowhere in your life journey did you learn, listen to me, how to make good choices when it came to partners. Well, I'll tell you a little secret, honey. If you're fool enough to think that you can go to the bar and find the first bar stool sitting, you know, lizard, and pick him up and make him into a husband or make her into a wife and all is going to be well with the world, then there is something wrong with your head. The biggest mistake people make in this life when it comes to partners and relationships has to do with the people they choose to begin with you start out I'm going to say it plain today because I don't know how else to say it you start out with garbage and you're going to get garbage mm -hmm. you start out with somebody they don't have to be perfect I would say look at me but I'm teasing look at me you don't have to be perfect. But when you look at somebody, do they even have the raw material there to be a good spouse? Do they even have the basic qualities necessary to be a good partner, a good husband, a good wife, a good spouse? Do you understand what I'm telling you? See, the problem is, we got people, and it's not a gay problem, it is a human problem. I don't care if you're man, woman, straight, gay, cross-eyed, or blind. People look at somebody, oh, he's cute, she's cute, whoop de doo That's all the requirements I need for a lifestyle. Oh, I'll tell you, how many times have you heard somebody say, oh, you're so pretty, I don't understand why you're single. What? Just because they're pretty, they should be married? Just because they're good looking, they should be hooked up with somebody? Honey, you are ignorant as ignorant can be if you think the only thing necessary to being a good spouse is looks. There's something wrong with you. You know what makes me laugh? You start a new job and you know what? That employer is going to put you through a period of training. They're going to put you through a process. You may have to sit for hours on end and watch videos to learn about the policies of the company that you're working for. To learn about the ins and outs of the job that you're going to be doing. They don't just walk you to a machine or walk you to an office and say, okay, here you go. Do the job, do they? No. Tommy came, he got a job here in Huntsville, Alabama. He's been in banking for decades. But this specific job has very specific things that you must do. They had him work with a lady that he was replacing. She was retiring. They had him work with her for over a month and a half. So he could learn her job. 
start a new job, you got to learn how to do the job. Oh, you want to drive a car when you're 16 years old? Mom and dad hand you the keys and say, okay, son, okay, young lady, go on out there and drive. No, they don't. No, they go to the proper office, they get the permit, and they will take you out in the car and they're going to teach you how to drive. Am I telling the truth? If they don't teach it because they're afraid they'll have a nervous breakdown trying to do it, then they're going to hire somebody to teach you. They're going to take you to a driving school where they can teach you. But before you ever are licensed to drive a car, you've got to be taught you got to learn the rules of the road. you got to learn the basics of operating an automobile. Am I telling the truth? But you know what you can do in this life without having any preparation at all? You don't have to do a thing in the world to prepare yourself. A, you can get married. You can hook up with somebody. Start living with them. You can get married. No training required. No learning necessary. No, because society believes that you learn everything you need to learn from your mom and your dad. Well, the problem is 80% of us learn all the wrong things from our moms and our dads. You can also have babies. No training. Girls have babies every day, don't even know how to put a diaper on a baby. Don't even know how to prepare a bottle for a baby. They literally, when a mother has a child in the hospital and she's decided that she wants to breastfeed, a nurse will come in and teach them how to breastfeed. Well, my goodness, how hard ought it to be? Right? Seems like it's a pretty simple process, you know. How difficult can it be? But there's actually a lot to learn. But we go through life and we constantly walk into things. We constantly walk into situations. We constantly walk into things that we have never spent five minutes preparing ourselves for. I grew up in a very dysfunctional home. One of the reasons that I get as depressed and despondent and discouraged as I do at times is because I grew up in an environment with a father who thought it was just his mission to tear his children down and tell them what worthless pieces of crap they were and how they never amount to anything and they never be anything. So when I'm trying to do something and I'm not seeing any success and I'm not seeing any progress, I get discouraged out of my mind because in the back of my mind, I've got that voice echoing in my hearing. I told you, you'd never be anything. I told you you'd never amount to a hill of beans. See, look. I told you. Look at the empty sanctuary. I told you. Some of y'all are blessed. You didn't have to grow up with a narcissistic father who thought that tearing down his wife and children was fun. I wished I'd have had your experience, but I didn't. So I have demons that I wrestle with every day of my life because of the way I grew up and the garbage that I heard every day of my life tearing me down and making me feel like I was lower than, lower than low, lower than the dust on the road. If I was to go into a marriage with little more than 
the lessons I learned watching my parents. <laughs> I'd be divorced every other weekend. They argued constantly. My mother had one objective in life when it came to arguing with her husband. Win the argument. That was her objective. And she'd say whatever nasty, hateful, hurtful thing she had to say. If she knew something especially troubled my father and bothered my father. And he seemed like he was winning the argument. Guess what she'd do? She'd say the most hateful, nasty, hurtful thing she could think of. Just so she could get a self-satisfied smile on her face. And walk away. <laughs> I got him. When I was about 12 years old, there was a lady in my church that I grew up in. Linda Kern was her name. I love Linda. I still love Linda. I still know Linda. One day, Linda came to me and she said, Chuck, I was in a Christian bookstore this week. And I saw this book. She said, I know you're only 12 years old. She said, but for some reason, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, buy that book for Chuck. She said, so I bought you this book. She said, I hope to God I'm not acting out of turn. I hope I'm not doing something I shouldn't be doing. She said, but this is what I feel like God told me to do. She gave me a book that was titled Letters to Philip. It was written by an ordained minister who was also a licensed psychologist who specializes in marriage counseling. And what had happened was, many years ago, his daughter, Karen, got married. And his daughter asked him, she said, Dad, would you write me one letter a week for the first year of my marriage? And in each letter, kind of offer me some instruction, offer me some advice, offer me some counsel on how to be a good wife and how uh, to make my marriage work, you know, because I know that most people go into marriages totally unprepared. She said, I don't want to be totally unprepared. And you deal with failed marriages every day. So could you just write one letter a week and explain, you know, maybe pick a topic or pick a subject and expound upon it. Well, he did for the first year of her marriage. He wrote her a letter each week for a year. At the end of the year, he had 52 letters that he had written to his daughter. He decided at some point, I don't know whether it was his publisher's idea or whose idea it was, but somebody suggested to him, why don't you publish those letters as a book? Because each letter dealt with a different subject matter, you know? And said that would be some of the most valuable, potent, important advice and teaching that any young woman could ever get who's getting married or who has gotten married on how to make her marriage work, how to be a successful wife, you know. And so he did. He published a book. It was called Letters to Karen. Well, when his son Philip got married, Philip said, okay, Dad, now it's my turn. Why don't you write me a letter a week and expound upon something to help me be a good husband? So he did, and he published a book, and it was called Letters to Philip. Linda Kern had no way in the universe of knowing what I lived with at home. 
She had no way in the world of knowing that I probably had the most dysfunctional, screwed up parents this side of heaven. That if anybody on this planet was probably doomed to have failure after failure after failure in relationships and marriage, it was myself and my two brothers. She couldn't have known because she had no idea what was going on at home. I took that book home. I was 12 years old. Now, I was always on the precocious side. So when I was 12, people always thought I was like 16, 17. I was a very big kid. I was my full height at 12 years old. And people, you know, always thought of me as being much older than I was. And I honestly, I thought older than I was. So I took that book home and I began to read it. And Tommy, over the course of years, I read that book through probably five, six different times. Every time I read it, the author would talk about, do not criticize your spouse in public. Do not argue with your spouse in front of the children. You know, just different pieces. And he would expound upon it for a whole chapter, you know, a whole letter. And he talked about all these different things. And I read that book and I read that book. And every time I read it, I kept checking off the boxes. My father does that. 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 But you know what Linda Kern helped me to do? Unbeknownst to her, she helped to make my life better. She helped to make me more successful in life and make me more successful in love and make me more successful in relationships because she helped me to at least put some preparation in toward the day that I would be married and I would be in a lifelong commitment. Most people will get married and they've never read a single book on marriage. Lady, if you have an opportunity, get you the book Letters to Karen before you get married. Fella, if you have the opportunity, Get you the book letters to Philip before you get married. The Word of God is not a legalistic document. It is not a book of do's and don'ts. It is not a book of absolutes. It is not a book of laws and mandates. It is not about heaven or hell. It is a book that contains the plan of salvation, yes. But it is also a book that contains the wisdom of the ages. The instruction of our Creator and our God who knows us. He knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows what we're made out of. He knows how we can be the most successful. We can be the most prosperous. How we can live our happiest and most productive lives. When we allow ourselves to be taught of God, we make ourselves available to a wisdom that cannot be found in a thousand years of living. Oftentimes we fail to experience the best blessings of our God because of our own lack of knowledge or our lack of wisdom. We ask the Lord constantly to do things for us and to give us things when we really need to be asking Him to teach us how to accomplish and to teach us how to achieve. 
rather than seeking for the Lord to hand us things. We ought to be seeking His wisdom and asking Him to teach us. My Lord, have mercy. Psalm 25, 4 and 5. Show me thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. Lead me in thy truth and teach me. For thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. Children will often say of their parents, Oh, they just don't want me to have fun. How many times have you heard a kid say that, right? You probably said it yourself. I'm looking at Tommy. I know he did. They just don't want me to have fun. We assign to our parents the worst motivations for setting certain rules or making specific demands. What a shame that we cannot accept that our parents generally have noble motivations for their demands. And they're generally not motivated by evil thoughts or devious schemes. But only a fool believes today that our God has motivations which are contrary to our happiness and our contentment. You've got to be pretty foolish to think that the things God tries to instruct us to do and the way, the path that the Lord tries to instruct us in, He only does so because He's trying to make our life miserable. You've got to be pretty foolish to believe that. In Jeremiah 29, 11, and 13, the Word of the Lord said, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace, and not of evil to give you an expected or a positive end. Then shall ye call upon me and ye shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. The Lord said, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected, a positive end, a constructive end. There's nothing in God that is there to try to make your life miserable. If the word of the Lord tells us that we ought not to engage in drunkenness and foolishness, that it's our lives are better for not sleeping around with every Tom, Dick, and Harry that walks down the street. It is not because God's trying to make you miserable. It's because He knows that those kind of behaviors can bring so much sadness and so much sorrow into our lives. In John 10 and 10, I quoted it a moment ago, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. In Isaiah 48, 17, Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord thy God which teacheth thee to profit, which leadeth thee by the way that thou shouldest go. It's not about heaven or hell. He said, no, I'm trying to teach you how to be profitable. I'm trying to teach you how to be prosperous. I'm trying to teach you how to have your best life. And when we as believers finally learn that the Word of God is there to help us have the best life, when we finally understand this and we begin to approach the teaching and the wisdom and the instruction of God's Word with this understanding, it will change everything. 
our entire walk with God will be different. Anybody that comes into this church literally has to learn a whole new way of looking at things, don't they, Tommy? Because this pastor preaches things differently than most pastors do. Yep. Most preachers get up and every single word in this book, oh, hallelujah, every word in this book, they're banging you over the head, they're beating you with it. You must do this, you must do that. You go to hell if you get drunk. You go to hell if you smoke a cigarette. You go to hell if you do this and that. And this pastor comes along and says, no, it's not about heaven or hell. Grace will get you into heaven. Faith and obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ will get you into heaven. The problem is, what kind of a life are you going to have between the altar and heaven? Do you want the best life? Do you want the most prosperous life? Do you want... A life of favor and blessing? Do you want to accomplish the most you can accomplish? Be the most you can be? Do the most you can do? Because if you do, honey, I've got a book that is full of all kinds of great wisdom. i got a book that is full of all kinds of sound advice and good counsel and this book will help you to realize your goals faster than any book that's ever been published they've never written a self-help book on the face of planet earth that'll help you to do more and be more and achieve more and accomplish more than this book will why because unlike other bo books which are written by people who are also the creation. This book's written by the Creator. Hallelujah. Some of my favorite people in the world are those who have taught me to this day, I can name every teacher I ever had while growing up. I can start at kindergarten, Miss McDermott, and I can go all the way, first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, Mr. Roach, fifth grade, sixth grade, Miss Russo. I can go all the way up the line. Can't you almost do the same thing? Why? Do you look at most of your teachers today despising them and hating them and thinking evil of them no most of us look back at our teachers and we're grateful for them aren't we we appreciate them we understand that they were trying to sow good things into our lives so that we could be the best we could be am i telling the truth oh at the time <laughs> we may not have liked him real well at the time but as you get older and as you mature you look back and you look back with appreciation in Psalm chapter 119 verses 25 through 27 my soul cleaveth unto the dust quicken thou me according to thy word I have declared my ways and thou heardest me. Teach me thy statutes. Make me to understand the way of thy precepts. So shall I talk of thy wondrous works. The psalmist said, <laughs> Lord, I've told you all about how I do things. Now you tell me how you want it done. You tell me how I can best achieve the ends that I'm trying to achieve. Because 90% of the time, if we look honestly at how we do things, we'll realize that we're not doing them the way we ought to. Am I telling the truth? In Psalm 32 and verse 8, I will instruct thee 
and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eyes. Psalm 119 verse 12 as well as verse 68. Blessed art thou, O Lord. Teach me thy statutes. And verse 68, thou art good and doest good. Teach me thy statutes. Psalm 143 and verse 10, teach me to do thy will, for thou art my God. Thy spirit is good. Lead me into the land of uprightness. Lastly, today, Isaiah 30, 19 through 21. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. Thou shalt weep no more. He will be very gracious unto thee at the voice of thy cry. When he shall hear it, he shall answer thee. And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity, and the water of affliction, yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner any more, but thine eyes shall see thy teachers, and thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way, walk ye in it. When ye turn to the right hand, and when you turn to the left. Oh, children of God, understand today, the greatest part of faith is trusting in the goodness of God. We cannot trust His goodness if we believe His instructions are meant to lessen the quality of our lives. When we come to understand that the Lord instructs us and teaches us not so much to prevent our sliding into a devil's hell, but rather to help us have better lives while on this earth, we then will be able to cry out with sincerity, Lord, teach me. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Teach me. I'm going to tell you, I'm closing right now. It took me a long time to learn this lesson, folks. When you grow up in fundamentalism, when you grow up in evangelical bile, and you're led to believe that God is a hateful, vengeful, judgmental, critical God who has nothing better to do than stand over your shoulder and beat you over the head every time you make a mistake. When you grow up that way, it's hard to believe in God's goodness. It's hard to trust Him. It's hard to accept that His Word is there for our good and not for evil. It's there to benefit us and prosper us. It's there to help us learn the way of blessing and favor. Oh, but I want to tell you, when I finally came into this understanding, my life took a turn a 180 degree turn. All of a sudden, I was telling my, I had to see my cancer doctor this week. And I was telling the young lady that I was the doctor I was talking to, I said, let me tell you something. When I finally reconciled who I am as a gay man with my relationship with God, and when I finally understood what grace is really all about when I finally, finally got my theology corrected and the Lord was able to help me understand His Word as it ought to be understood. I said, let me tell you something. 
I have never been so blessed. I have never been so prosperous. I have never walked in such divine favor as I have the last 30 years. My ministry has been a miserable struggle for 30 years. But my walk with God has never been better. And I'm struggling every day to help people in our community, not just gay people, straight, gay, cross-eyed, and blind. I'm trying to help everybody who will listen to me understand. You've got to get your theology right. Because what's been preached at you for eons is wrong. The truth of the matter is, God wants to teach us. Jesus came to teach us. Every man shall be taught of God. God himself revealed himself to humanity so that he might teach us. Not just how to make heaven. You don't have to learn a lot. You just have to believe and obey. <laughs> But he came to teach us a way of life that is full of blessing and prosperity and favor. Praise the name of the Lord. Lord, teach me. Amen.